Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I wanted to uh, say I appreciate you guys uh, being a part of what's happening, what God's doing, what we're saying and seeing and hearing. Because first off, I'll, I'll have to tell you, I know up front that everything I say is very unusual and controversial to most people's ears because of, of the traditions and the religious ideologies we've all been raised in. And, and you know, those, those ideologies aren't uh, strange to me. I used to teach them <laughs> years ago. I taught a lot of the things. But then my study and my research, I began to realize that it, uh, it's hard to validate some of those things, if not most all of them. And the thing that, you know, like over the years, one of the things that was uh, most striking about this church and this fellowship, this group, was we always had one of the most phenomenal praise and worship teams. Always. I mean, it just in the last number of, I guess since one source, I guess, dissolved. And that's been what, seven, eight, nine years ago? Yeah. It's been quite a while back. And so we haven't had a worship team since that period of time. And it's not that, uh, that I don't love that part of, the, of service. To me, that's, to me, that is one of the most uh, enriching parts of a service. To me, I love the praise and worship. I always have and always. And so we've always had that up in just the last, like I said, six, eight, nine years. And uh, anyway... Pray that God will bring that part back together for us again so that we can experience it. So there's a lot of uh, good in light worship, or I always enjoy. <laughs> so I, I know this, like I said, I know the things I'm going to share are a little out of the box, a little different. So what I want you to do is, again, if you would, just put your hand on your heart or your chest and touch yourself. And just repeat this after me. Say, my body, my body is the temple, is the, temple the, house, the house, the home, the home of this term, of this term we, call God, we call God, which is the source, which is the, source, the, power, the power, power, and the intelligence. And the intelligence. As, God, As God, source or creator, source or creator, creator, I am also a creator. I am also a creator. I must learn what to create. I must, I must learn what to create. create. And what not to create. And what not to create. I am not a mistake. I am not a mistake. I am designed. I am designed. With purpose and intention. With purpose and intention. My purpose. My purpose. My aim. My aim. Is to live life. Is to live life. To its fullest. To its fullest. Now, having said that. I'm going to uh, take off and talk about some things that, uh, that first off, and I realize that it's different, okay? I, first, I realize, number one, it's very different to hear what I say. Have you all noticed that? I've had people tell me that. I remember it's been, uh, gosh, it's been hmm, 15 years ago, I bet, that I used to go to Greenville. North Carolina, uh, and go up there and teach every two or three months. And at that time, I didn't travel a lot. Mostly, I just stayed here, local. But I had been here st local, studying for years and years. And so I'd go up to Greenville, and I would teach and share to a group of people up there every, about every two or three months. And uh, the guy who was over that, he said, Lynn, you need to get your teachings out to a, a broader base than just those people there in North Georgia. And I said, really? I said, he said, you should start a monthly CD or put your stuff out uh, in that fashion. And so, and so I did. Uh, I can't remember how many years ago we did. And that, of course, did open up a lot of areas for me. And so, so anyway, the things that I share will come out of a lot of years of just research, just asking questions. You know, I, I remember 
25, 30 years ago, some of the things I will share with you, I would argue that with God in my own study, my own time I would be studying scripture and I'd see something and it would make me mad or I would get upset and I would lay my Bible down or put it down and say, God, that can't be. You know, and you might not do that. I did that. I do that even to this day. It was not, not, not near like I did back then. I'm, I realize now if, if you're open-minded, you, you're going to see something new every day. I, it just, that's just the way it is. That life is that way. And the reason I say that is life is going to offer you something new every day. I don't care. It's going to offer you an opportunity. Uh, it's it just and that and all that those opportunities that life offers you are not always a good opportunity. Sometimes there are opportunities that you need to turn away from. Mm -hmm. Really? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sometimes, yeah. but that's life. See, life. Is, have you ever noticed that every day is not a beautiful day? Yeah. No, they really is. Some of them are gloomy. And it's just made to be that way. That's part of life. But to learn to live life to its fullest is to learn to choose the opportunities that's presented to you. Because every opportunity that's presented to you is not necessarily what we would call the good one. But every opportunity that's presented to you is a learning experience. If we can learn to learn to discern that moment and grasp the experience that's, that's there for us. So I'm just going to read you something I, I wrote just uh, this past few days. The idea of coming to the earth realm is to experience life. That's, that's why you're here. And you did come here. You may not realize that. You thought, uh-uh, my mom and daddy made me. <laughs> well, your mom and daddy took part in you coming here. They did. They were, they were vessels that God used to bring you here. It was your idea to come here, and you might you don't remember that, but nevertheless, that, that's that's in the uh, the eons of the past. But nevertheless, it's your idea to come here. But your idea of coming here was to experience the life that's offered here in this dimension. Think about it now. <laughs> I hear wheels turning. That's why you came here was to live the life and to experience the things that this dimension offers you. Because see, this dimension offers you cold and hot. This dimension offers you health and sickness. This dimension offers you all of the opposites. And it's left up to you to choose what you want out of these things. And you say, oh, I wouldn't do that. Oh, yes, we would, and we do. A choice made out of ignorance is a choice. Oh, I didn't know. <laughs> I know. And so I, I, what I teach and what I try to get people to see or try to get us to understand is just because I made a choice out, out of ignorance, I don't have to stay in that. I can move on past that, or I can get free from that and make a better decision, make a decision that will serve me for my greater good, rather than just to stay in a situation where it's not serving me for my greater good. I have to make these choices. So I came to the earth realm to experience life. Many of the things that we experience in life are not life, but distractions. See, maybe you think about it. You ever experienced something that was a distraction? And when I use the word distraction, I'll just read you the definition that I'm thinking of behind the word distraction. A distraction is a thing that prevents someone from giving full attention to something else. That's a distraction. <laughs> yeah, well, we have them all the time. We just don't. Pay attention to them. Or we're not really uh, being aware of them. Now we have a term that we call that if we're paying attention. If we're paying attention or we're, or we're using our awareness, we have a term that we use and we call that. And what that term is, is we say we're waking up. Really you're not. You are awake. You were asleep last night. I hope y'all got a little bit of sleep last night. A little bit. <laughs> <laughs> You're awake. You are awake. But we have this term, and this is a new age term that we've all picked up, and I even say it myself, that we're waking up. We are paying attention to becoming aware. And the more attention that we pay, the more aware we will be. And what we're doing is we're learning to pay attention to all of the opportunities that life is offering me. Because life continually offers you 
circumstances or different things. Always. And there's always a distraction there. Always. And that's to divert your attention. Okay? Or that's one of the meanings of it. The other meaning of it is an extreme agitation of the mind or an emotional feeling that can also divert your attention to what life is offering you. So what comes into our life every day is not completely from our own doing. See, think about that. That's what the word, you can read in the book of Psalms, if you'll read the Psalms, you'll read this, and at the end of many of the Psalms, there'll be this little English word, old English word, S-E-L-A-H, Selah. And all that word means is to pause and think about that. That's all it means. Just pause and think about that. So when I say that, that's what I mean. Just pause and think about it. So uh, say this again. What comes into our life every day is not completely our doing. It's partially our doing. Because many things that comes into our life on a daily basis are the results of the things we've been doing. <laughs> yep. that they are the result. Of, so if you do a thing over and over and over, you will get results out of it, whether it's serving you for your greater good or not serving you for your greater good. You're still going to get results out of it. In other words, if you do something that's healthy, that's, that's life-sustaining for you, and you do it over and over and over every day, eventually that thing that you're doing over and over will serve you for your greater good. If you're doing something that's not for your greater good over and over and over and over and over every day, eventually that thing will not serve you for your greater good. Happens to us all the time, but we don't pay attention to it. We, don't, we just don't pay attention to it. If we paid attention to it, then, then we would make different choices most likely. Not always, but most likely. Because you know every choice you make, it has circumstances attached to it, and many choices are difficult. Hmm. Okay? You are real quiet, so maybe I, you're thinking. So every day offers, you, uh, offers us many opportunities to choose. Life is given to us so we can realize its potential. Life is limitless and continues to move on. Now what do I mean when I say that? Life is limitless. In other words, there's not a limit to what all life can offer you. It can offer you things that won't serve you and it can offer things that will serve you. And if it's offering things that won't serve you, and you take those in, life just keeps going, even if those things that you have taken are destroying you. In other words, life is like the sun. Did you ever notice the sun don't stop in the middle of a happy day? <laughs> it, just, it just moves on. It's actually not the sun moving on, it's the earth realm rotating and turning. But it's still, I mean, you know, you can, you ever had something really sad that happened to you and you just, you just milked that for a little while and you, so you stayed there sad? You can stay there a long time. People can grieve a long time. It's not necessary, but you can. It's like I remember a story that was told to a general that his son got killed in World War II and, uh, he went, had to do services, and, blah, 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 and then he grieved. And then a day or a week or so later, he was seen somewhere, and he was happy and enjoying life. And somebody said, well, aren't, why aren't you grieving? He said, I did. So how long do you want to stay in grief if it's not serving you? Do you realize some people stay there a long, long, you realize some people get stuck in grief? And you realize it ain't serving them a bit? It's destroying their life? Hello? <laughs> yeah. People get stuck there, don't we? Don't we? But life don't stop. It, it don't stop. I mean, it, it just moves right on. It just keeps on going. Life is given to us so we can realize its potential. Life 
is limitless and it continues to move on. If life doesn't stop at the happy moments or the tragic moments, it continues on with the movement of the sun and the earth. It, it's, it's designed to be that way. Now, I have said this for a lot of years, and I continue to say it. This Bible that we have all revered and not necessarily studied, but just about everybody's got one, even though we don't read it and don't study it and don't take offense to that, I, I, I wouldn't ask you to do that. I'd rather you, if we could just learn to listen. I know a lot of people who can get the better out of life never read this book. And I have had even people who come sit under my teaching and said, I just can't read it. And I said, then you should. Don't worry about it. it it's not going to make you or break you. But this book was written int intentionally as an instruction manual to show us how to live life. And it's written intentionally about the temple, the house, the home that God built to live in, which is your physical body. And, you know, we can go in Scripture over and over and over to show you that that's what this book is about. It's about the house, the temple. In Old or New Testament, it doesn't matter to me which way we'll go. we can go to either one and show you it is about the body. So I started this quest 30-something years ago, 35 years ago in the book of Genesis. And it's like I got stuck there. And I don't mean that in a negative. I, got, I found a gold mine in Genesis that seems to be a vein of gold that you can't extract the bottom of it. It is bottomless. It just continues to unfold the riches of what's there for me. And so I spend a lot of time in Genesis. I spend a lot of uh, research about things. And so I'm going to show you some things out of the book of Genesis that probably you've never seen before. But even though you've read these verses, you've read these, but you've never taken the time, most people never take the time to study and research even the simplest of words. And so I find myself too often, many times, just digging in words. So go with me to Genesis chapter 3. As a matter of fact, if you just want to find the first book and the last book of your Bible, pro probably that's all the places we'll go. We'll not go somewhere in between. <laughs> but uh, let's see. Miss Linda, you don't have a book. Hmm. I do not know where they put them. Okay. All right. Genesis chapter 1. And I want to point out some words as, as I go through. I want, to, uh, I want you to see these words as I go through here. Genesis chapter 1. And then I want to ask you what you think about that word. Okay. Genesis chapter 1, I mean chapter 3, I'm sorry, I said chapter 1. Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Okay, everybody got that? 3, verse 1. Now the serpent. Okay, now I've, I've harped on that. I'm not really harping it, but I, I know what most of us think. What you read when you see serpent or think, I'm sorry, what you think when you read the word serpent is what? Snake. No. A snake. Huh? And so what happens in your mind, most people's mind, is their mind will go into most likely another scripture that they think of, and that would be that old serpent, the devil. Is that how you is that how y'all would think about that? That's what most people would always think. That old serpent, the devil. And so they would put serpent and devil in the same sense. Say the same thing. Right? And what we do? It's the same thing. It's not. Okay. The word devil comes from the Greek. It's not even, did you realize the word devil is not at all mentioned in the Old Testament? It's not. Because the word devil is not a part of Hebrew mythology. The word devil comes out of Greek mythology. And it actually comes from a statement that's in Latin that's called uh, Dues demon inversa. Now that's Latin. Dues which means double. Demon. I'll tell you what that means. Demon. You heard of demon. Demon and devil, same thing, right? Yeah, yeah they come from the same word. Inverse. Dues means your double is seen in the mirror 
as your own reverse. So your demon is the thing you see every time you look in the mirror. What do you see when you look in the mirror? You see yourself. See yourself. Mm -hmm. So what is your demon or your devil? Mm -hmm. It's yourself. Mm -hmm. Now that was Greek mythology. So the New Testament is written based off Greek mythology. So if the New Testament talks about the devil or a demon, that's what it's talking about. If Jesus cast out a devil or Jesus cast out a demon, he's casting out a thought or an imagination that someone is having of himself. Now that's difficult because see we have we have all these other ideas that have been given to us by religion. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. So when you see the word serpent there, you're thinking most likely that the serpent is the devil. But that word serpent actually in Hebrew is nachesh. And the word nachesh actually means to learn by experience. Okay, that experience is not your only teacher, but many times experience is one of your best teachers. Have you ever noticed that? I mean, some of the most horrible experiences I've had in life were some of the best teachers I had in life. It taught me some things, especially if I was paying attention. So that's what that word means. Nachash means to learn by experience, and it also means to diligently observe. And to diligently observe means to look at something intently to study it. And that's exactly what I do a lot of times with words. <laughs> I look at those words intently to study them, to see what does that word mean. But I want you to watch this now. Now the serpent was more subtile. Subtle or subtile. What do you think when you read the word subtle or subtile? What do you think when you see that? Huh? Cunning. Cunning? Is it, what about the rest of you? Any of you have another word that you would use for subtile? Cunning? Crafty. Crafty? Deceitful? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Just look. Hope you can kind of hold and back up into the second chapter and the last verse, the 25th verse. It's just the verse above the one you're looking at there in chapter oh. 3. Right? Verse 25, it says, And they were both naked. Now, what do you think of when you read that? They didn't have any clothes on. <laughs> <laughs> they, did. they did not have any clothes on. So, they were both naked. So, who are you thinking of he's talking about? Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve. Exactly. It, you see, Adam and Eve's name's not even mentioned here at all. You say, but yeah, but Brother Lynn, the man and the woman's name man and woman is mentioned. Well, the word man is eash, and the word woman is easha, which is actually referring to the energy of the brain, the human brain that has a male and female attributes to it. That's what it means. That's what it's referring to. But it says right here, I would just say that they were both, in other words, the male and the female side of your brain were both the word naked and the word subtile is the same identical word. Same identical word in Hebrew. It's not any different. It is exactly, it's aru in Hebrew. So the word naked, they were both aru. Or the nachesh was more aru. Same word, but yet here in English they use two different words that makes you think two different things. Now I, I don't know about you, but I think that's a little sneaky. <laughs> why would the translators do that why would they take the same identical Hebrew word Aru I'll, I'll just put it up here in English I'm going to put it on A W R U H Aru that's spelled different from that in, in Hebrew but now, the word aru, I want you to hear the definition of this word uh, aru. Uh, it means to be prudent. Now, do you get out of naked and subtle? Do you get prudence? No, you don't. <laughs> but that's amazing how that the Hebrew word aru, that's what it means. It actually, the word actually in Hebrew means prudence. They were prudent. So, 
they were, the word also means skillful. So you don't get out of naked, you don't get skillful. Out of subtle, you don't get skillful, but this is what this word, this is what this Hebrew word means. It means to be skillful. It means to be prudent. It means to be quick-minded. Now let's look at these verses of Scripture now again with this, this concept. And look at verse 25. It says, and they were both skillful. Now you're going to start thinking differently, right? Exactly. They were both prudent. They, they were, if, if you look at it this way, they were quick-minded. Who are we talking about? We're talking about the male and the female attribute to your brain. You know, to say your brain's naked, that doesn't do much for you. <laughs> or to say that your brain is subtle, that doesn't do a lot for you. I mean, you can say, oh, God, I better watch that booger. <laughs> but to say that your brain has been created so that it is quick-minded or that it's skillful or that it's prudent, that's a whole different ballgame. So if I come back and I look and say that the serpent or the nakesh, my ability to observe something gives me a prudence. It trains me or it teaches me to be quick-minded. This all makes sense now. And so as I start to read the story now, I begin to realize, wait a minute, I'm created of God to be skillful, to be prudent, to be quick-minded. And if I can practice that and I begin to do that, what would it do for me? Let me tell you what it do. It will enhance your life. So that your life will begin to give you a stronger sense of making the choices of what's being presented to you every day, every moment. So the word ashamed has to mean something else too. I'm sorry? The word ashamed has to mean something else too. All of them do. It's amazing to me. If you go through and you start, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you. I'm just picking on a few of these words because... You know, when you go through here and you read this and you say, the serpent beguiled me, you think, well, that stinking booger, he deceived me. Because that's what you will read when you read the word beguiled. Right? Yes. But it comes from the Hebrew word, nahash shayayini. And if you listen to that word, shayim, that's the same word as shayim, that's heaven. So I can say the serpent Heaven to me. <laughs> yeah. Actually what it means, the serpent or the, the, my brain and my nerve system, that's what it's referring to, my ability to observe, my ability to be quick-minded, it gives me, it sheens me, it lifes me. That's what the word heaven. It means I have a life above and a life below. It begins to enhance that. But when we read it with these words, because you see, words paint pictures, and many times if the picture, if the picture's been, the word's been crafted or twisted or changed, then you get the wrong impression to everything you read. I, mean, I don't know about you, it does, it does that to me. So when I come through here and I start studying this and I begin to see a different picture, I begin to realize, whoa, there's a lot more here than maybe what has met my eye. And I'm going to do this with quite a few words, like these common words that you have heard, whether you've ever read the story or not, you've heard this because you've heard it preached. Preachers get in the pulpit and preach it. And you know what we've been taught? I was taught the same thing. If the preacher says it, bless God, it's the truth. And all the, all the preacher many times is doing is just regurgitating something he heard another preacher say that he thought, wow, that really sounds good. And so he said it too. When I was a young preacher and just started out preaching 40-something years ago, I would listen to other preachers and I would study what they were saying and I would extract my messages from what they were saying. Yes. And then I started studying and reading. And when I started studying and reading, I realized, you know what, now what they're saying is not lining up with what I'm reading and what I'm really getting when I study. And so I quit preaching my messages off of what the other preachers were preaching that was real popular. And that's all they do today. You go on TV and watch your TV preachers and that, this is preaching almost the same thing, this is preaching almost the same thing, and it's just almost preaching the same thing. They put their own twist to it by adding their own personality or by adding their own deceit, whatever. 
without a lot of study or research that goes into it. This book should be designed to transform and change your life and show you how to live your life to a greater extent, not to try to beat you up, not to try to put fear in you. Matter of fact, this book tells you very clearly there is no fear in love. And God is love. So why would God want to put fear in you through a preacher trying to scare the hell out of you? Hmm? You can go to any church you want to in this county. And I don't care what name's got it out there. At the end of that preaching service, that preacher is going to try his best to scare the hell out of you. And put fear in you. And say, God's going to, and then he'll fill in whatever. He's going to burn you forever and ever. You're going to die and go to hell. And there's a lot of uh, people that think that if, if uh, things is not happening to them, if that contrast is not there, then the devil's already gone. Because he's got no reason to try to mess with you. So, but I realize how difficult what I'm saying is for us to hear. I mean, I get a lot of phone calls, you know, from the way for people, Kirby puts them things out there and people say, huh? <laughs> That's like, it's like this one lady who was a, who was a college professor. Uh, she was given some CDs of mine. This has been 10 or 12 years ago or something. And she was a college, she was a seminary professor. She was teaching young people how to preach what traditional churches preach. And she heard me, she, listened, she said, this guy, and this is what she said, this guy is crazier than hell. And I will prove it. I, I, and so she got, from this other person, she got uh, five or six CDs that they had, teachings, the teachings that I had done. And she took those and she began to critique them and go over and study them and study them and study them. And her husband told me, he was sitting right there in the living room, he said, she'd been doing this for weeks. He said, all of a sudden, he said, she slung her Bible across the room. He thought, what is going on? He, she said, it's all a lie. He said, what? She said, everything we've been taught is a lie. She said, this guy is, I cannot prove him wrong. She said, I've got to meet this guy. <laughs> so she called me. She called me on the phone. She said, I heard you were having a conference there in Dalton in North Georgia. And I said, yes, ma'am. She said, is it open? Can anybody come? And I said, oh, yeah. Yeah, we'd love to have you come. And she said, well, I've been studying some stuff. And I, I she said, you've rocked my world. And I said, well, now, if you want to come, you're welcome to come. But we don't want to debate and argue. I'll be glad to sit down with you and discuss anything I teach. She said, oh, no. She said, you've already rocked my world. And so her and her husband came to that conference, and she became the lady who took over my monthly CD. And her and her husband and a team of people in Knoxville began to take my monthly CD and distribute them. And then she got sick with leukemia quite a number of years back. And she passed that baton on to Kirby and Beverly. And they moved here from Missouri to do that very thing, to take on that monthly CD. And her, her and her and her, John and Suzanne Wade, Suzanne passed this last December. And I tell you, she was a phenomenal person. But she did what everybody should do. She got, when it rocked her world, she got the scriptures and began to study and research. And she realized, wow, the truth really will set you free if, if you will let it. So, I want you to see some things with me. Let's just go back to, uh, just like these words. You know, uh, it's not easy to do the kind of word research that I'm talking about that I do but it's not hard for me to do it because I've done it for so long and I'm not encouraging people, you know, if you can extract from what I say, then just do that. Don't get, don't let your mind say, well, you got to study and all that. No, leave it up to me. I'm not going to tell you a lie. I, I'm not going to mislead you and I am open if you can show me that I missed it on, on a word. I, I'm open to that. 
I'm very open to that. I want to be open to that. But, let's read on. Let's just, go. verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtile than any of the beast. And the word beast is the Hebrew word che, which you all are familiar with the word tree of life. The tree of life there in Genesis 2. The tree of the knowledge. The tree of life and the tree of knowledge. And of course we always add good and evil to that. But those are the same tree. The tree of life, che, the word che actually is the energy source that's inside you. You can't see it. It's just like a tree. If you see any tree, you can look out here at any of these trees, you can see the tree, but you can't see the life that's living that tree. Because the life that's living that tree is under the ground in the root system. Because Jesus even makes the illustration, if you want to chop a tree down, you've got to go to the root or it'll just come right back up. Talking about different things in your own life. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Why? Because And that's, is that word beast? That's the word che. It's life source. Now why do they do that? I don't know. You'd have to argue that with King James or you'd have to argue <laughs> with the people who wanted to translate it this way. Because they're trying to tell a story to give you a different idea of what God was really saying. And it's a shame, but nevertheless, it's just as simply that way. The beast of the field which the Lord God had planned, had made. Now why would God make something that won't serve you and definitely won't serve God? Hmm? Mm -hmm. He wouldn't. <laughs> Nor did he. God didn't serve, God didn't create something that wouldn't serve the, the purposes of God. You say, oh, but brother Lynn, there was rebellion in heaven. Okay. Now where'd you get that idea? Well, I heard a preacher say it. <laughs> you did. I know where the preacher got the idea. I'll, I'll try to look at that with you this morning if we get a chance to get there. But I'll show you where the preacher got the idea and I'll show you how he got deceived by that idea. It's all a matter of research again. It's all going back to just look up the word. Just look up and find the root of the word. See what they say. So, which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, this is Asha, Yea, hath God said, Thou shalt not eat of the tree of the garden. And we go through this on and on. And drop down with me to verse 4. It says, And the serpent said unto the woman, Esha, You will not die, for God doth know. I want you to watch, pay attention to this. God doth know that in the day that you eat, your eyes, your eyes. Now, when it says that, what are you thinking? Eyes, your eyes. When you see it, what are you thinking? You thinking about this right here? Yeah. Yes. Now, are your eyes open? Yeah. Wow. Well, I wonder why it says that if you'll eat of this tree, your eyes will be open. Do you realize that we are one of the a few creatures that are born with our eyes open? You know, a cat, uh, many, many animals aren't born with their eyes open. Many of them. But we are. We're born with our eyes open. Why would that say right there? If you eat this tree, then your eyes are going to be open. Well, because you see that word I, it's the Hebrew word ayin. The Hebrew word ayin. It's pronounced this way. I'll just put it up here. A-Y-I-N. And actually, it is this Hebrew glip right here, and it has a 70 value. And that glip is called ayin. And the thing about this glip is that it refers to your I, E Y E, singular. And this word right here, ayin, is singular, it's not double. So it should not be E Y E S to make it plural. As in to say, my eyes, referring to these two, it should be singular. It should say, my eye will be open. And the word ayin actually, as your eye, refers to your pineal gland. So if I showed you that in conception, in conception, you would look just exactly like a worm, you'd have seven 
endocrine glands in which one of those seven endocrine glands would be right there between your eyes and that gland is called your pineal gland. You ever heard of that? Yes. Very important gland. And the thing about your pineal gland is that if you have a tumor in your brain, do you know how they detect that tumor? They find your pineal gland and they find out because your pineal gland is directly between your ash and your asha, your male and your female brain. It's directly between it right here. You can go into some of these convenience stores that's owned by the Indians around here. And if you go in there every now and then, you'll see one of them have a red dot right here or a black dot right here. And all they're, they're symbolically saying is they are working at opening their pineal gland or they're working at opening their third eye. And they call that the eye of God. So, he says right here, and, and you have to grasp the, what's saying here, everything that's being said here in this 13th and this third chapter is about the serpent, the Nakesh. And the serpent or the Nakesh, I'll show you how it looks like, uh, give you a side view of him. Uh, That's the side view of it, looking at it from the side. So if you could see that looking at me from the side, what you would see is you would see my upper brain, then you would see my upper brain has 12 nerves on the right side and 12 nerves on the left side. You can look this up in the medical dictionary if you like. It's called the 12 paired cranial nerve. So you have 12 over here and 12 over here. In the book of Revelation, it's called the 24 elders. 12 and 12. 24 elders sitting around the throne. And you know what a lot of people said? Oh, those were the 12 sons of Jacob and the 12 apostles of Jesus. And you know what I said? Yes, that's exactly right. Why? Because they are symbolic. The 12, the 12 sons of Jacob and the 12 apostles of Jesus are symbolic. What are they a symbol of? They're the symbol of the 24 elders that sits around the throne or the crown. What's the first thing they say when they see the baby's head coming out of the womb? Crowning. It's crowning. Mm -hmm. Why? They're looking at the crown where the 24 elders sit. So if you saw me from the side, this is exactly what you would see. And of course, you would see my, my eyeballs right here, my nose, and my mouth. You'd see my mouth, and then you'd see my neck. And then you start to see my arms and my shoulders, and then you come all the way around down to my gonads. And that's the nachesh. It's your central nervous system. It's attached to all of your five sensual being. It's your see, smell, taste, touch, and hear. That's what it's attached. This is what this is talking about. It's referring to your ability. Notice what it says here. It says your eye, and that's the, again, it's not plural, it's singular. It's the word ayin, and the word ayin in Hebrew means fountain. What is a fountain? Water. A fountain is a place that spews life out of it, water, resources. That's exactly what your pineal gland is. It is a fountain that will begin to spew. It will begin to release. And that's what the word means. And notice what it says. It says, it shall be what? Open. Open. And you know what the word here, open? Open in, in the Hebrew, actually, it just means panash. And actually the word means it will learn by the experiences. And, that, and that's exactly what we're talking about, is learning by the experiences. Learn how to experience life. Learn how to uh, observe life. Pay attention. Just to pay attention because you're, you're here to live your life so it's 
probably would be good to pay attention to it, right? Because there's things that I do. I'm talking about myself. The things that I do, if I pay a little more attention to that, I wouldn't have done that. But if I wasn't paying attention, most likely I'd do that, especially if I'm caught in the moment. Right? Yep. I mean, I would. I, maybe you would. Go with me to Genesis chapter 32. And I want to show you some more about this uh, pineal gland. This pineal gland is right here. Right there. Right there. You can say between your eyes. Between your eye. Now this passage that we're going to look at over here, you, you've all have heard this. Genesis chapter 32. And uh, it's a story, and we've all we've all heard the story. But again, I'm not sure if we've paid a lot of attention to it. But if we, if we pay attention to it, now I want to talk to you about this story. Verse uh, chapter 32. Look at verse 24. Anybody got that? Mm -hmm. It says, "And Jacob." Or we can call him Jacob. Jacob. Y'all you remember Jacob? Mm -hmm. Now what what was about Jacob? What was there about Jacob? Jacob. He was Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They were the three patriarchs, right? Mm -hmm. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? And so let's just look at the story. It says, And Jacob was left alone, and there wrestled a man with him until the break of day. Have y'all heard this story? Y'all remember this story? Mm -hmm. Yes. And what were you told about this story? It was an angel. It was an angel. And some people said, Jacob wrestled with an angel. And some people said, well, no, Jacob wrestled with God. If you, if you look down, verse 30, <clears throat> and Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, I have seen God face to face and my life is preserved. So some people say that Jacob saw God and some people say Jacob wrestled with an angel. It, it doesn't matter which way what they want to say that. But what did God do to Jacob then? Look at verse 28. And God said, Your name will be called no more Jacob. But what? Israel. So is Israel the name of a nation or is Israel the name of a man? Now you're taught today that Israel's a nation. But the scripture says that Israel is the name of a man. Is the name of a man. God said, I'm going to call you Jacob no more. I'm going to call you Israel. Now really in this story, the picture of this story is a picture of the pineal gland that's what he called the name of this place. He said, I'm going to call the name of this place because this is the place where you open your pineal gland. So I'm going to call this place pineal. Hmm? Why? Because it's there where you open your eye and you begin to see. Where did you do that? At pineal. And what happened? God said, I'm not going to call you Jacob. What does the name Jacob mean? The name Jacob actually means deceiver. Supplanter. Supplanter. Is that what you said? Yes. That's what his name means. Deceiver, surplant. That's your physical person. That's your natural man. Your natural man, when he's called, he'll try to deceive or, <coughs> or lie. That's mm -hmm. the nature of it. So I'm, I'm not saying it's right or wrong. But now your, your spiritual man, the one that's renewed, what, what did he get renewed because it wrestled with God? Have you ever wrestled with God? Well, that's a wasteless thing thing to do. You ain't going to win. Why are you going to wrestle? Now let's go back up here and let's look at this. Let's look at it. Wrestle. Wrestle. It, this word wrestle in Hebrew is only found two times in the Old Testament. Because what do you think of immediately now? I, I'm asking what is your idea of wrestling? Struggling. Struggling. So if me and Kirby got up here and we began to struggle with each other, or we're hugging each other, or we're trying to throw each other down on the ground. What do you call that? Wrestling. Wrestling. <laughs> wrestling. <laughs> That's it. My grandpa. My grandpa was one of my heroes. 
But I remember, we didn't have a television. Our house burnt down in 58. But we lived on Grandpa's farm. He had a huge farm. And so we, li it, we lived in a house that my grandfather owned. And lightning hit the house and burned it to the ground. And so we moved in to Grandma and Grandpa's house, which was the house that my mama grew up in, which was a big house. I think it had five, six, seven bedrooms. It was a big house. And there wasn't nobody in it but Grandma and Grandpa. <laughs> so it was plenty of room. So we moved into the house. Well, Grandma and Grandpa had a TV. Now, I, we hadn't had a TV. And, and, and I was, at that time, I was 10 or 11 years old. And so, uh, so we get to watch TV, but we only get to watch what Grandpa watched. But now ever, I think it's Friday and Saturday night, Grandpa's going to watch wrestling. <laughs> and I'm telling you, and Grandpa get out on the edge of his chair and he's working with that. He's wrestling with him, guy. I said, Grandpa, that's fake. Oh no, that's real. <laughs> Grandpa get all he get all upset. He said that was fake. That was real wrestling, buddy. He was he was watching it. So this word wrestle. Now, how foolish do you think it would be for a man? I don't care who the man was. I don't care if it's Jacob or Colin Mears. I don't care who you're calling. He's going to wrestle with an angel or he's going to wrestle with God. How, how foolish. Now that's, that's somebody that's certainly not picking his fights very good. <laughs> he, he ain't got a chance to start with, right? I mean, even if he got a big stick, he still ain't got no chance. Right? No. Yeah. Okay, hold your place right here. Just go back to two chapters. Go back to chapter 30, verse 8. Chapter 30, just turn back over there and look at verse 8. <coughs> Y'all found it? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> and this is about where uh, <coughs> Jacob, or this is about <coughs> where the, these women are giving birth to the 12 sons of Jacob. <coughs> okay. Right, are the 12 tribes of Israel. <coughs> so when you understand the 12 tribes of Israel are the 12 sons of Jacob, and you've got to realize that he didn't get these women from, I mean, he didn't get all these kids from the same woman. Right? <laughs> A little strange things like that, huh? Oh, okay. Verse 8 says, And Rachel said, With great wrestling have I wrestled with my sister. Wow. Now this word wrestle right here is pathot. That's the Hebrew word pathot. And you know what it means? It means to struggle. Pathot. Means to struggle. Like if I said, me and Kirby got here and we get it wouldn't be a whole lot of struggling. If Kirby leaned real heavy this way, then I'm gone. <laughs> <laughs> if he says on me, I'm in trouble. <laughs> right? Because he's bigger than me. Okay? And that's what that word is, pathot. It means to struggle. But now look over here, look back over to chapter 32, and verse, it says, and Jacob was left alone and he wrestled. Now, you'd think that would be pathot, right? Because that means to struggle. But no, this is the Hebrew word, abach. Abach is used twice in the Old Testament. And you know what the word actually means? The word actually means like particles. Now wait a minute. Jacob is wrestling with God and this word means light particles. Here's what's happening. Let me give you another picture of the story that will shoot, that will because whatever was happening, this this got this man in the hollow of his thigh and began to ch it changed his life. It says it changed the way he walked. And every, you know what everybody said? Well, that angel or God got the upper hand on him and jerked his leg out of socket. Right? That's what they told you. Jerked his leg out of socket so he walked with a limp from then on. Right? <laughs> yeah, that's what they told you. That's what the story seems. But yet this is not even a word for wrestle. This is a word that means there was a light show. How many of y'all have ever seen a light show? Fourth of July? Wow, what did you do when you saw that light show? Ooh and ah, didn't you? Ooh, look at that. Oh, look. <laughs> wow, well look here. This guy is having a light show that's touching him 
Now you have to remember, God is light. Yes. So what is he seeing? He's seeing all the colors of the rainbow and even beyond that. Because every color that you can imagine is in those seven colors. Those seven endocrine glands. Seven yawns, days. Seven lights on the golden menorah candlestick. See, all of those seven is about the miracle of you. The miracle of your physical body. And so the miracle of this physical body now is beginning to see this light show and in the light show it actually touched him in the morrow. When you know where the morrow comes from, don't you? The morrow comes from the air that you breathe, which is spirit, going into the lungs that God created you in a physical body and is transformed in the lungs into the blood and from the blood into the platinum and the marrow of the body, the bone of your body. Hallelujah. Touches you at your core. And there ain't nobody fighting here. There's nobody struggling here. There ain't nobody wrestling with an angel or with God. What's happening is they're being transformed in their pineal gland. Right here. This pineal gland is being opened that they can see the majesty of the Creator itself. Hmm. Completely different than any story you've ever heard because the stories that you and I have been taught are stories that have just been twisted and manipulated for years and years and years and years on end until very hardly anybody even asks questions about them anymore. They just accept them firsthand, even though they don't make sense. Even though you can even take a little three or four or five year old start telling him that a snake talks and he'll argue with you. Snakes don't talk. <laughs> and they don't. Never were intended to. You know. But yet we, we tell those stories until we try to get people to believe them. And when they, people believe them, they put themselves in a box and don't even realize, wow, I'm in this box. I believe this. Is this serving you? Well, no, it actually has got me boxed in. You know, are you afraid of this figure you call God? Well, actually, yes, because you, so you don't even... You don't even revere your father? No, I'm afraid of you. You think that really that really uh, makes God happy? You think God would really be happy because you're afraid of him, terrified of him? Not at all. Not at all. Hmm. God reveres us when we respect him, when we see the source and we respect it for what it really is. So I want you to think about this. Let's just read this whole story. I'll close with this. It says in Jacob, Jacob, he was left alone and there he wrestled. I'll just change it and I'll say he saw a light show until the break of day. He began to watch this light show. And when he saw that, when he saw this light show, he, he prevailed not against it. And he touched the hollow of his thigh you see, this went deep enough into him that it touched the hollow of his thigh, of Jacob's thigh, and was out of joint, and he wrestled with him. And again, there he began to view and see this light show. Same word. Verse 26, and he said, Let me go, for the day breaks. And he said, I will not let you go except you bless me. And he said unto him, What is your name? And he said, My name is Jacob. In other words, he's getting real here with himself. He's beginning to see himself, and he said, look, I'm a deceiver. <coughs> I'm a sore planner. I realize, I realize my own weakness, my own physical doings. I realize that. And he said, your name will no more be called Jacob, but Israel. In other words, now you're going to be the prince of God. You're not going to be a terrible God. You're going to be God's prince. And this is the story for every one of us if we will just begin to open our eye. In other words, if we will begin to allow the pineal gland and you know there's practices that you can do to do that? Really, there are meditation practices. There are practices where you'll close your eyes and just breathe a certain way. And if you breathe a certain way, you'll begin, without opening your eyes, you'll begin to see a multifaceted of colors. You really will. If you'll just practice it. And it doesn't take a long time. If you just practice it for 5, 10, 15 minutes, it's called meditation. In other words, just getting quiet, just kind of shutting your brain down, kind of shutting your mind down, kind of shutting all that 
thinking down. And that's difficult. <laughs> I, I know. It's difficult to do it. But if you mm -hmm. do that, then you begin to open that pineal gland, that third eye, that eye right there, that you can begin to see as God sees. Because that's how God sees the world through you. He doesn't see it through your eyes in a dualistic fashion. God sees it through the pineal gland. And he said, you're not going to be called Jacob no more. You're going to be called Israel. For a prince hast thou power with God and with men, and you have prevailed. And Jacob asked him and said, Tell me, I pray thee, your name. And he said, Wherefore it is that thou hast asked after my name, and he blessed him here. Jacob called the name of that place Peniel. Peniel. For I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. Hallelujah. That's the same thing you and I will experience every day. We begin to get, get these things tweaked and twisted just a little bit so that we can say, wait a minute, God's not this angry, mean old man that's wanting to get me that's just taking a list and checking it twice and going to find out if I've been naughty or nice. And at the end of the day, at the end of life, boy, I'm in trouble. Not so. Not at all true. God's not taking the list. God's not checking it twice. God's not seeing whether you're naughty or nice. God just sees what's happening and knows what's happening. And you know what? The mercies of God endure how long? Forever. Forever. That means that God, the, God, the love of God is forever. And the love of God never has an ending, never has a condemning, never has a judgment. Sees it as it is. Always sees it as it is and always is willing to love you and me and always willing to forgive you. I mean, nothing you can do, God won't forgive you. Hallelujah. Nothing you can do that the love of God is not there to cover you. I don't care what it is. Hallelujah. Now, that is a true God of mercy, <laughs> not judgment. And that's, that's exactly who we are serving is the true God, the God that... Uh, that uh, uh, I brought this big old thick book out and forgot to read out of it. Mm -hmm. I actually wanted to read what he says about Jacob. And I'll close, I'm going to close with it. It says that the significance of the changing of Jacob's name to Israel is this, that the mind controls the body through the nerves and the great nerve, the sciatic, runs down the leg through the hollow of the thigh. The, the will acts directly through this nerve and when the individual through his mentality or understanding parentheses Jacob exercises his I am power upon the natural man in an attempt to make unity between spirit and the divine natural there is a letting go of human will in other words Jacob's thigh is out of joint and a great light, that's the light show, of understanding breaks in the struggling of soul when it discovers that there is a divine slash natural body. See, it's always God's purpose to marry the two, to take the natural physical body that God created and the divine spiritual body that emanated from God and make them one. Merge them. Make them one. That's the whole work of everything and everybody in life. Make the two one. See? Pause and think about it. All right. Any questions?